I remember, I think it was like three years ago, I did a session with an A-list celebrity that Mm -hmm. is someone that I just think is the cat's pajamas, the coolest person ever. We were in his bedroom, like with me guiding him. And I was like, what can I possibly offer this person that he doesn't already have? Like he has everything. And that's when it hit me. It's like, no, like no one has anything. We all have nothing. Welcome to Big Energy. I'm your host, Cassie Underwood, here to give you a dose of that good energy and talk with people who do it best. Each week, I bring you the knowledge we need to be the forces of nature we came here to be. This week, I have one of my best friends in the world, one of the most brilliant human beings I know, Biet Simpkin, on the show. Biet is the world-renowned meditation leader dubbed the David Bowie of meditation. As a musician, Biet weaves the world of pop culture and spirituality, teaching practical applications of ancient spiritual wisdom. The teachings are featured in Biet's best-selling book that y'all should all go and get right now, Don't Just Sit There, published by Simon & Schuster. Raised by a shaman in New York City, Biet signed to Sony Records at the age of 19 as a singer-songwriter. Diving into a rock and roll lifestyle, Biet became a high-profile DJ in the fashion and art scene in Manhattan. However, following a string of life-changing events, including the sudden death of her daughter, Biet turned to her lifetime study of meditation and launched the Guided by Biet event series. The meditation experience reached a contemporary audience in cultural spaces, including museums, hotels, and fashion shows. These groundbreaking events were scored by her own music and were the first time meditation was mixed with pop culture, creating the revolutionary new trend. Featured in Vogue, Forbes, Elle, and Time magazine, and as the resident meditation guru at the Sundance Film Festival, One Hotels, MoMA, and Soul Cycle, Biet advises spiritual best practices for hotels and brands. Biet is best known for modernizing the spiritual path and has been called the meditation guru for the next generation. Her breath work was recently featured on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. And honestly, her work is so sexy. You guys aren't even going to believe your ears. Her life story is so profound that you just can't believe how resilient she is and how inspiring it is to hear this. I'm so excited to introduce you to Biet Simkin. Biet, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm so good. It's so good to see you. So good to see you too. Oh my gosh, we've been apart for so long. So it's so wonderful to see your face. You guys, I'm so excited to introduce you to Biet Simkin today. She is just so fucking brilliant and beautiful and a spiritual rock star has been a huge inspiration for me, a huge expander for me and someone who has really shown me the way to create a life beyond my wildest dreams. So I'm just super honored to have you here today. We've known each other for 13 years. Whoa. Is that crazy? crazy? That's crazy. I know. Do you remember when we first met? I do. Do you, it was outside the bathrooms? That I don't remember. Wait, where do you, what do you remember? (laughs) I just remember seeing you all the time and like us (laughs) connecting and me just thinking you were like the most beautiful girl ever and being like, who is this girl? Oh my God. I thought the same thing about you. So I remember that we met outside the bathroom rooms at a meeting. I was wearing a white suit and you were wearing very cool glasses. Oh, it was yeah. a meditation meeting. Yeah. And you told me about your dad. Oh, wow. I was very shaky because I had just spoken about meditation for the first time in my life. And you told me that your dad was a shaman. And I was wow. like, holy shit, what? <laughs> tell me more. So I thought we could start by sharing with everybody about your dad and what it was like to be raised by a shaman. My father used to say to me, you are a much higher teacher than me because Mm -hmm. you wouldn't have chosen me as a father if that wasn't your purpose, if that wasn't your path. And I look at me and what I've done with my life, like I literally sit around thinking about fractal geometry. I literally sit around like reading thick texts about the meaning of existence. I do this for fun. Like that is what I think is fun. And I think it's fascinating. I'm like, 
how did I like, this is who I am. Because the truth is, is that when no one's around, when no one's watching, there's no documentary filmmaker going around following me all the time. That's what I do with my day. So I do think that he influenced that because he was that he just sat surrounded by esoteric literature and he meditated all day and he was super, super wise. And he had he had the secret emanating from him. Mm -hmm. But when it came down to it, his death was the thing that awoke my spirit. It was like, almost like a parasite in the sense that my life when he was alive, and he died when I was 28. I just worshipped him. It would be like if your father was Eckhart Tolle. Mm -hmm. And every time you had a problem, you walked into the kitchen and he was like, but you know, (laughs) <laughs> there is no meaning to any of this. I depended on my father to remind me that there was no meaning to any of this and that there was no problem. But I myself actually wasn't capable of conjuring that level of equanimity on my own at that time. What do you think that he would say makes you a higher teacher than he was? Oh, I don't know what that even means, higher, lower. We're probably the same. I think he just meant to get such a head start right? Like to be doing headstands and sitting in Lotus at the age of two and three, to be lighting incense and learning about transcendental meditation at the age of four. That's not a typical childhood. And his idea was like, if you're trying to learn this shit at this age, he believed in reincarnation. And he just thought anyone who would choose this incarnation. Also, I didn't get the same father as my brother. My brother's eight years older than me. So my father smoked, beat him, yelled, and didn't believe in God when my brother was coming up. Wow. And then no he had a sp- Yeah, no kidding. And then he had a spiritual awakening in the woods of Russia and he got tuberculosis and then cured himself of tuberculosis with a secret shaman in the woods of Russia at the age of 40 or 39 and then he turned to my mom and was like, "Let's make an intentional freedom child and move to a free country to America." And she agreed and they did that. They intentionally created me for the purpose of creating a freedom child. And then they exited communist Russia to come to the States. And I was born a month later in Queens, New York City. So after your dad passed away, what happened next? I was really in shock because he was my higher power. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have any access to God on my own. And I just I didn't even really know then that I was agnostic or atheist because I was lying to myself and I believed I was a faithful person. I got sober a year later. So you can imagine the year between when my father died and when I got sober, like 28 to 29 was like, it was bottom. Your mom had also passed away when you were age seven. Yeah, almost seven. Almost yeah, seven. six, almost seven. Yeah. Yes. So when your dad passed away, it was a complete shift in your entire life. The year afterward, total mayhem, chaos. Yeah, it was like Requiem for a Dream, if you've ever seen that film. Um, yeah, so Darren Aronofsky, like, really captured my, you know, there wasn't any, like, dildos per se, but it was, it was dark. It was really, really dark. And <laughs> there was moments where I was like, wait, did I just... Did that just happen? Like it was, it was just so, so dark. And I just remember reaching these like debilitating states of being so demoralized and not recognizing myself. I'm an artist and Mm -hmm. I'm a cosmic, like I'm a weirdo, sure, but I'm not really a person who wanted to live the dark life. I think it became very apparent when I tried to do those things, when I tried to live in that like criminal world, Mm -hmm. it just didn't match my frequency at all. And so I finally just crawled into sobriety at the age of 29. Wow. And so when you got there, tell me more about, because I think this is a really good point about basically feeling like you were faithful, but you were actually agnostic or atheist. I think it's really important to talk about. So what did that look like? What did the thoughts look like? I know I've definitely, I mean, even now I've been practicing this stuff for years and I'll still go into self-delusion that like I'm super faithful and I always believe, right? And then really nothing about my emotions are matching that belief. Absolutely. Oh yeah, for sure. I think that back then I lived in a world where I was filled with fear and doubt and shame and sadness. And I I saw the evidence when I looked around my life, I saw the evidence of a lot of failure or, or that's how I saw it. And also betrayal, like to lose your entire family while you're growing up 
and to be in poverty the way that I was, which was, it was so distinct. I remember looking around or looking on the TV and I was like, this does not look the same. Like, I don't look like the girls on Growing Pains or whatever the shows were when I was growing up. I was like, these people have something I don't. Structure, money, clothes, like I I just had nothing. And my mom was dead. So my hair was messy. My socks were mismatched. My house looked like a bomb hit it. There was no maternal figure just to have that much pain. And I made that mean that God had forsaken me. That was the interpretation that I came up with. Like, well, if there is a God, he certainly doesn't give a fuck about me. That's how I took it. And I couldn't see, like, yes, I had a huge ego. And so I was able to be like, oh, well, I'm like really pretty. And I hang out with celebrities or whatever I thought was important at that time. But at the end of the day, all that was just insecurity. You know, it was like a mask. I couldn't really see how valuable I was because at the end of the day, I didn't really believe that God loved me or there was a God personal to me. I truly believed that if there was a God, I I think I, I related to Gnosticism, which is the idea that God left us. That's a whole religion based on that, like God was here. He was really into us. He created us. And then he was like, peace. (laughs) <laughs> that's, dark. that's so dark <laughs> it's so dark and that's where I was I was dark yeah. like I like atheism was like oh I just don't believe in God I was like oh no there's a God and he's a fucking asshole like he mm-hmm. abandoned us I think and a lot of people feel this way which is what I think our work is so much about is reminding people how it actually works it doesn't work the way we think it works because if we think about it we're always going to come to the same conclusion, which is that God is an asshole and he has fucked us over. That's the only conclusion that a reasonable, rational mind can come up with. Mm -hmm. But if you just relocate the thinking into the heart center and you relocate the thinking into the body, it's no longer a thought, it's a sensation. And I believe that God can be understood through sensations, through revelation, through emotions, through love, but cannot be understood through reason. And I was really trying to understand God through reason. And so the problem with that is that as soon as I would try, reason would tell me, you're all alone. You're hurtling towards death like everyone else. No one is connected. You're all like, if you were to die of cancer today, your friends wouldn't give a shit because they're not dying of cancer. Reason is such a bitch. Like it really will fuck you. It's like a mental track to be, yeah. to be on. And like everything that gloms on to that track is fearful and dark and sad. And I'm all alone and like, don't get it twisted. There's nobody here for you in this life. Like that's, Totally. So what is it that got you over to the other track? Because we all go back into that reason place, right? I mean, that's part of the function of the mind. What happened to bring you over to the other side? There were so many pieces, but I think it was mostly actions. People think that they're going to get sober through like thinking it through. And what I can say for anyone who's listening to this, who is having any struggles with that kind of thing is you just can't think your way out of that kind of thing. You need to act your way out of it. And action by action by action, little tiny actions will add up. I think it's also using divided attention, which is a tool that I teach in my book, but floating above yourself and seeing what you look like from above. I could see myself for the first time and I was like, oh, you're really, you're really like kind of an atheist, Gnostic, like agnostic. You're not a faithful person like you've been saying. And the thing is, is that the story was so woven. Listening to my father for years and years and years and years, I would parrot him. I would just repeat the things he said because I was like, well, he knows what he's talking about. But it's one thing to repeat what someone else is saying and it's another thing to be a thing. Mm -hmm. And to be a person of faith is, is a leap of It's a leap away from reason and you have to do it consistently over and over through a day. It's not like a decision. I think people think that they can leave reason and go to faith. It's like a one and done deal. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is that leaving reason to faith is something that you probably need to do hundreds of times a day for the rest of your life. And I do that with a tool called pausing. Like I pause and I allow what I call God and I'm not religious to enter into me and give me insight. And then I obey. I see my life as just like a servitude and obedience to that light. Yes. Okay. I love this. I love so much about this. So one thing that 
is really important that you're talking about is the difference between basically regurgitating stuff that people have heard before. And I feel like these days, most of us have read, you know, a lot of the same books or we're familiar with a lot of the same slogans. They lose their nuance, yeah. people, you know, and if you, if you don't practice it, you don't know that there's nuance until you practice it. You don't know that you have to actually make adjustments in the way that you're thinking about certain things. And you can't just say like, I am worthy and feel worthy. There actually has to be a depth of mm. practice and a daily, a minute to minute showing up for this work. Um, and that's just, I just want to underscore that because it really makes the difference between living a very frustrating spiritual life <laughs> where you think, you know, you think it's working, you want to believe it's working, but it's not really working versus something that's actually functional and creating magic and blessing your life. Okay. okay. So let's talk about obedience because this word in a cultural feminist context, you know, people might take issue with it. There's a lot of context in which people might be freaked out that having been reared by bad parents, you wanted them to be obedient. But oh my God, right. and there's this belief that if we're obedient to God, that God's going to make us live a shitty ass life, right? We're going to be told to be celibate or to do something that doesn't bring you joy at all. What do people need to know about the truth about obedience to God without religion? We're not talking about Christianity or any other form of religion. We're just talking about a relationship with some form of higher power. Yes, I'm definitely not talking about being obedient to like Christ or a traditional non-allegorical way, right? Because I do study the mystical side of all religions, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, like on and on and on. But to me, the mystical side means to look at the allegorical meaning underneath these things rather than the literal interpretation. Like, okay, so then Moses went and like parted the sea. Like, who gives a sh Like, that doesn't make any sense anyway. But, but, what, and I just always remember being like, how come people don't go around parting seas now then? If that happened 2000 years ago. And it's like, because it doesn't mean what it says. Okay, anyway, the point is, is that, um, <laughs> the point is, is obedience is about, for me, like I have a lot of rigidity and I don't think I'm alone in that. Rigidity means that like if some something happens in my life where I was supposed to do something at 10 a.m., but then it didn't happen because so-and-so was late or such and such went wrong or the refrigerator broke and then the repairman had to come and things got shifted around and I didn't get to do the thing I thought I was going to do at 10 a.m. because of X, Y, Z. So that's rigidity. And I don't know about you, but for me, the way I experience my rigidity is that I start to almost hyperventilate when things don't go the way they're supposed to go or the way I thought they were going to go. Or if I get a text message, um, this happened recently. My current cleaning lady was like, I can no longer come on Saturdays. So can you make Mondays available for me? And I was like, but we work from home on Mondays. So how in the world will we do this? And so I was like, that's it. I'm getting a new cleaning lady. This is some bullshit. And I went like into getting a new cleaning lady. And I remember I was kind of like having a hard time breathing. And I was like, this is so stressful. Like, why does this shit always have to happen? As soon as you think things are like mellow, a new stressful thing happens, which is hilarious because my problems are that I have a cleaning lady. As someone who <laughs> grew up with no fucking cleaning lady, I'm just making a joke about that alone. But anyway... I was very upset. And then I prayed and meditated. And my husband and I both agreed that we were being rigid and that we can figure out how to leave on Monday and just let her come on Monday. And as soon as we did that, it made everyone's lives better. It made her life better because she gets to stay as our cleaning lady. It made our life better because we're not so like rigid, like it has to happen on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And that to me is where God and pause and obedience comes in. Because if I wasn't being obedient, I would have gotten a new cleaning lady. It would have been a huge trefuffle to like teach her the entire house and how to clean it and all this stuff. I, I saved a, us a ton of stress. The cleaning thing, it's no small potatoes. If you're a mom who runs a business, it's like a huge fucking deal. I just want to point that out to people. Like if you're not a mom who runs a business, it, this is a non-negotiable. I mean, it's like literally make or break your life. And so you were listening to the download and because of the download, you were able to, to make a really easy shift that makes everybody yeah. better. Yeah. But it's not easy. It's easy for God. It's not easy for me. Like if right. it was easy for me, I wouldn't have been so stressed out for several hours looking for a new cleaning lady. Like my life is amazing. The fact that I spent two hours looking for a cleaning lady is the least of my problems. It's more so that I 
I'm able to return two hours later and be like, yeah, maybe this is just insanity. Like just fucking shift to Monday and work it out. Yeah. And, and I did that and I was like, oh, that's not that big a deal. Yeah. I had a friend uh, who used to say God's will is not a logistical nightmare. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's a good point so good. that's one of my favorite so <clears throat> let's talk about getting high without drugs and alcohol what was your favorite drug or thing to do i liked heroin and cocaine i mean obviously i loved lsd and mushrooms and ecstasy but i think on a daily like i was really into heroin and cocaine yeah i was allergic to opiates so mm. that was really unfortunate <laughs> slash unfortunate because you're still <laughs> yeah. here Exactly. Yeah, but I love my alcohol. What did it feel like to be on cocaine and heroin at the same time? Well, cocaine feels like you're very confident on cocaine. And so you say a lot of things and you think the things you're saying are really profound. Like you, the voice of God is speaking through you on cocaine, Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, in sobriety, how it feels to have God channeling through you. Yeah. And also know what what it's like to be on cocaine. I loved cocaine. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So you feel very confident in yourself. You feel like you're channeling. And then like you feel this channel and you're so excited and surprised and enamored with the words coming out of your own mouth and everyone else's, but mostly your own. And that's cocaine for me. And then the pain of going down off cocaine is pretty pretty intense and you're going down and it's like you feel like you're gonna die your heart is beating out of your chest you're really like oh wow like what a price to pay and that's where heroin Mm -hmm. came into the picture is Mm -hmm. that would use heroin to deal with and soften the blow of coming off of coke so as soon as I was like done with like a whole night of coke and it was like 11 a.m the next day or 12 we would drive to Bushwick to our heroin dealer. And like the whole drive, I was like, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. And then we got the heroin, snorted the heroin, and then I would take a warm bath and lay all like heroined out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, her- what? Yeah, it was so crazy. I don't know how I didn't die, but I didn't die. And I didn't wanna die. People think that when people live like this on the edge that they're suicidal. I wasn't suicidal. I really thought, I just thought it was worth it. I thought, life was a horrible place. The world was a horrible place. I remembered that I came from alternate planets where it didn't feel or look like this, Mm -hmm. which I then thought that those planets were better than this one, which I was wrong about. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me more, because I've heard Earth is like the hardest assignment. No, I think Earth is it. I really, I... Yeah, I used to think that Earth is hard and with the Buddhist thing, like finally one day I'll fucking incarnate off this motherfucker and like finally I'll be free from the debt that I'm paying on this fucking planet. And one day I'll I'll enlighten myself finally off this field of hell. <laughs> and and now I see it as very, very different. To me, it seems like I already know what heaven is. I am heaven and I remember heaven and I'm in heaven quite often. But to be able to be on earth, it's just so phenomenal because it is the actual place where we get to watch the transformation of hell into heaven. Mm. We get to actually like the raw material is here of hell and then we take it and we eat it and it tortures us and the agony of it. Like even Jesus on the cross was like, God, why have you forsaken me? I know that for a moment and then later he was like, whatever, I'm just, you know, enlightened. But for a moment he was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Like on a cross, motherfucker, like where did you go? Do you know what I mean? So I do think that that's how it is for us. And and we have this feeling always like I'll be enlightened and I won't have those moments. I won't have two hours where I'm looking for a new nanny. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. You have the hours You have the anxiety, you have the pain, you have the agony, you have the grief, you have the greed and the sadness and all these feelings that I really used to think were like criminal because I was so obsessed with this idea of enlightenment being this final arrival where these things would finally be overcome and over. And today Mm -hmm. I just see it as such a privilege to be able to behold my feelings. I think about my music and my lectures and my books and like all the things I do in the world. They would not be here. I would not be here if it wasn't for all of those things. My pain, my agony. I think my baby is crying in the, in the other room. I don't know if you can hear it. No, I can't hear oh, it. Okay. 
She's with she's with my <laughs> oh, look at the cash. She's been a bit of a mess today. Oh, is she okay? Do you need to get her? No, no, she's okay. She's with the nanny and my husband. If you're a bad bitch who's ready to create a massive shift into abundance and ease around money, I've got good news for you. I officially reopened the doors to my popular program, Money Metaphysics for Maverick Women. It's a six-month group program where you receive direct guidance from me, live calls, instant access to my 13-module course, Big Money Energy, plus a two-day in-person retreat and tons of other live support and content. Learn more about the program at CassieUnderwood.com forward slash MMMW. Check it all out now and register at CassieUnderwood.com forward slash MMMW. Okay. So tell me a little bit about what it feels like. So we know that cocaine, we feel like we are, you know, channeling God. We're like saying the most brilliant things ever. We're having those brilliant thoughts. We're shocking ourselves with our brilliance. (laughs) And um, and then we have to come down. And for me, the worst was the existential piece of that. Not even like the physical, but it was like how I felt without any drugs and alcohol, but like on steroids. So how do you mm. access that without the existential and then that heroin bath? Like, how do we feel all that? If somebody had to get themselves to that state of bliss, of channeling, of feeling confident. I mean, it's like, <laughs> a, it's an artillery. And- it's an artillery. It's an artillery. It is frustrating, I think, when you really figure it out that life is dependent on all of these like really rudimentary practices. Mm-hmm. I think for me as like a rock and roll chick who's very rebellious, I think it frustrated me. I'd watched a lot of avant-garde cinema growing up. I based my meditation around that kind of stuff. I wanted to be the kind of person who just kind of woke up and was really cerebral and like naturally sauntered to the grocery store and like (laughs) ate a bite of a bagel and then like drank some coffee and then just went and wrote for three hours or something like that. Like that was my dream that I could just be this person who without any effort was just going to wake up and be really fucking awesome. And Mm -hmm. what I found out through being a sober woman is that, no, I actually have to meditate for about half an hour. Then I need to work out for about an hour. And then I need to do somatic exercises. And then I need to make sure that I don't look at my phone all morning. And then I need to journal at some points. And then I need to experience pain if I'm in any pain and allow myself to feel feelings. And when I'm done with all of that, then that's only that's when the work begins. That's when I start working for a living. That's just the morning practice, right? And then at night, too, there's like a bunch of things that I do at night. So I think it can be frustrating, again, for anyone who's listening and is like, wait, so how do I get the cocaine, heroin, Mm -hmm. LSD high in life? It's like, oh, yeah, well, it's like a bunch of really, I think, uncool boring, repetitive stuff that's non-negotiable too, which sucks. Like on a day when I, if I have to skip any of those practices for any reason, it's not the same level of attunement. I'm more like a Mozart piece on those days. You know, I'm just kind of like, you know, like (laughs) the Requiem. It's just hardcore. I'm like, oh, I will make it through this day. It's like, "Ah, ah, ah, ah." (laughs) Like, life is really intense, you know? Yes. Amen. I mean, the level of practices that I have to have to just feel what I perceive to be normal, but is really actually, I I have to say is probably way above the level that most people feel. I just have no tolerance for emotional discomfort. I have no tolerance for it. I have some tolerance for physical discomfort. That part Mm -hmm. is like, you know, but the emotional discomfort, zero, like the the, the smallest hint of friction with other human beings, with fear, mm. anxiety, anything like that, like feels like everything is over. Like I'm done for, stick a fork in me. So mm. the practices, I mean, life is spiritual practices to me and, you know, just like habits. So what, how many, how many hours do you spend doing these habits in the morning before you work for a living? A couple of hours a day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's probably do you wake it, up early. No, I don't. I wake up. I mean, I wake up when the baby wakes up, which is like six or seven. That's Um, early. Are you kidding me? Is that not early? (laughs) But that's very early. Oh, it is. I, I mean, I guess so. But I don't wake up earlier to do these things before I just go into childcare. 
And then when the child care help comes, that's when I go into my spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. And then after I'm done with that, I begin my work day, which is like podcasts and meeting with my clients and shooting courses and whatever else I'm doing with my life. And then when I'm done with the day, there's more spiritual stuff through the day. I do breath work through the day. I pray all through the day. I don't just like pray once and call it a day. And then I just, yeah, I do all kinds of stuff. I try to create as many pockets as I can that are filled with humility because the more I'm obsessed with myself and like, because I'm very successful, I'm surrounded by a lot of successful people. There's a lot of like stroking ourselves and being like, oh God, we're just so amazing, you know? (laughs) And it's like, I just can't fucking do that all day. I need a break from the ego, like, self-tugging, masturbatory self-love. I need to go into yet you are nothing. And the, the only reason you're even here is because this conduit of light is able to express itself through you. And the best thing you could do is shut the fuck up, sit the fuck down and behold it. I need those kinds of practices. So yeah. I do serve. I do a lot of service. I do free service. I do whatever I can to get out of the ego like because in my regular life it's like I'm at the fucking Grammys all day long like it's so fancy and I think that the ego can take that and really ride with it you know yeah well let's talk about let's talk about the Grammys and your sexy clients and that part of your life because it's really freaking fun and I think it's amazing that you do all these practices of you know of service and humbling yourself and bringing yourself back down but you've worked with some really amazing people yeah and your career. You've been working with Russell Brand yes. and he's already known as a spiritual teacher. So you're like a spiritual teacher to the spiritual teachers these days. <laughs> That's funny. I never what thought is, of it that way. What's it like working with him? He's such a wonderful human being and it's been such a pleasure forging the friendship that we have and guiding him. And he loves, he just really loves the breathwork technique that I've been sharing with the world for many years now. And so it's just been such a joy And he actually just shared my breath work on The Tonight Show a week ago. Yes, it was so 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 cute. Yeah, Getting on his knees and putting his hands up. If you guys haven't been to one of Viet's events, definitely go whenever the world opens up again, because you're going to get to experience this for yourself. But it was hilarious. Jimmy Fallon got in front of his desk and Russell Brand was teaching him how to do Viet's work. Yeah, it was so funny. I know. I was like, oh, Fallon, like, no, 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 no. But he was so, he was so funny. Like, I mean, that's what you're going to do. You know, you're going to buffer. You're going to buffer. What is he going to do? Like actually have a celestial experience on national television? Like he, he didn't want to do that. So he was just kind of like pretending and. Yeah, you could see he was having to keep himself mentally yeah. out of the. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't going in, but he was just kind of like. <laughs> and also that's a really intense exercise. It's to- really intense. Yeah, that if he had done it, it could have he been very like different. He could have fainted on. Yeah, that would have been really funny. <laughs> Don't you wish? <laughs> Maybe that's when I when I go on. I'll be like, stop, do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Don't Russell brand me. Like, do it. <laughs> It's so funny. So um, <clears throat> when, when you're working with these celebrities and you work with a, a lot of celebrities, is there any real difference between working as, with a celebrity and working with, you know, someone who is not living that life? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think that's essentially what changed in my life and why so many celebrities work with me is that I just really started to see that because it was really hard for me. I remember, I think it was like three years ago, I did a session with an A-list celebrity that Mm -hmm. is someone that I just think is the cat's pajamas, the coolest person ever. We were in his bedroom, like with me guiding him. And I was like, what can I possibly offer this person that he doesn't already have? Like he has everything. And that's when it hit me. It's like, no, like no one has anything. We all have nothing. When it comes down to it, at the end of the day, we all have nothing. And Mm -hmm. so someone with nothing has nothing and someone with everything has nothing. And if you separate people and you make certain people special, you're just lying to yourself. And, and I really saw for myself too, because I was becoming more and more famous over time as well. And I was like, I still like support in my life, you know? So if I like support, doesn't that mean that he would like support? And I'm really good at supporting people in this way. Like I transform their lives and take them to these alternate universes. Why can't I do that for him? And that was one moment, but then it took many more moments like that where I finally saw that 
I was separating myself and I was doing it as a defense mechanism out of jealousy. I was so jealous of famous people because my dream had always been to be famous myself that when I was around them, I was so embittered with jealousy that I would push them away by saying to myself, oh, you're so much better than me which was just enabling and feeding my jealousy. So the more I brought them down to the planet and was like, yeah, you're just a fucking person like everyone else. You have marital problems, you have fears, you're also gonna die. Like, you're just like, just like everyone else, you know? And like, maybe you get in front of a camera and then are in motion pictures sometimes, but so what? You're just a fucking person. And then that allowed me to really revel in how amazing these people actually are too. Like I've always loved people who are really willing to live extraordinary lives, whether yeah. it be in music and science and theater and film in directorial and writing, when people are really pushing themselves to the limit of their creative abilities, that always inspired me. It sucked before because then when I would get around people who actually were doing that at the highest level, I'd be like, oh, you're too good for me. And that really made me so sad. I had a lot of work to do around that. And once that cleared, it was just gone. Like I know, I just no longer feel like celebrities are anything different than anyone else. I still think it's fabulous to be a celebrity. One time I saw Christopher walk in on uh, the actor's studio and James Lipton or whatever his name was, was like, what would you be if you weren't a famous actor or whatever? And Christopher Walken was like, I'd be a famous artist. And then he was <laughs> like, he was like, let me just be clear. I wouldn't be just like an artist. I would be a famous artist. And yeah. I was like, that's it. Once you are famous anything, I think you can make that distinction. And I think until you are, sometimes you can't because you're like, oh, it's wrong to say famous. Like, who am I to say that I should be a famous artist? But it's like, once you get that, you get to decide. I decided I wasn't just going to be a spiritual teacher, but no, I was going to be a famous spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. And once I made that distinction, the universe supported that distinction with me. It wasn't like, yeah, fuck you. It was like, oh, that's right. You've remembered correctly. Ding, ding, ding. That is exactly what you're here to do. <laughs> I love that because people do make fame, wealth, all that stuff wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I personally think it's an excuse for not striving for your greatest. Totally. There's it's just nothing, jealousy. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be famous or wealthy or anything else. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I love owning it. I love that you own it. And I actually feel most comfortable around people who are able to just own that level of ambition. Yeah, it takes some balls because there's a lot of baggage that people carry around money and power and fame. They feel like they need to apologize for. And that's actually a reason why most people never become any of those things. Because if you spend your whole life hating those things or pretending to be weird around them as a defense mechanism to your own ambition. Like I remember when I found out I was ambitious, mm -hmm. I was in shock. I had no idea I, because I was so full of shit and I had been like, I don't care. Like I just, I'm so profoundly wise. I just don't yeah. care. And then one day I was just like, yet you're, you're like mega ambitious, mega. Yeah. And I was like, me? Like <laughs> I remember like turning around being like, who are you talking to? Like, I'm, I'm so easy going. And like, and it's just like, no, yet you're really ambitious. And I owned it. And it felt like it literally felt like 10,000 pounds was removed from my shoulders that day. And it's been like that ever since to just walk around and be like, I'm a vain, fucking power hungry, like, vain, 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 motherfucker, like, super <laughs> fucking vain. Like, I haven't gotten any face work yet, you know, but <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, no, definitely on the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> like, give me another 20 years. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I look like Susan Sarandon. And <laughs> <laughs> so good. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I remember when I realized how embarrassed I was of being ambitious, of desiring to have money and fame and all those things you're not supposed to want. I mean, it felt like my dirty little secrets, like those for me felt so shameful. And so once I admitted them to myself and then started trying it, uh, out admitting it to other people, it really changed my life. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's why we help people is because we're not harboring the secret. And so people are like, wait, can I, can I tell you, you know, like, and I have clients who I'll just tell them, you know, like they know, 
my rates. I talk about their mm-hmm. rates. I help them with that kind of stuff. And they're like, Absolutely. what, what should I charge? And I'm like, I don't fucking know, but like, doesn't you make it up, you know, like you make up <laughs> what you charge, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Like, yeah, you it's get not to a moral decide. issue. It's not an ethical issue. It's just what you, your rate is your rate. Totally. Absolutely. So let's talk for a moment about motherhood. <clears throat> yeah. Can we talk about Ula? Yeah. In that experience, I think that so many of my listeners will really relate to this because so many of them have been through maternal losses. And I wrote a book, not at all the same kind of thing, but about my abortion. And uh, I remember actually, I've never told you this, but your song Speedball, you yeah. know that song? I found somehow, well, you know, do you know that song you wrote? I somehow <laughs> found that. <laughs> I found that when I was writing my book and it was so inspirational. Oh, wow. When I was listening to it. Yeah. I listened to it a lot when I was writing my book. Oh my God. So yeah, it's a gorgeous song. You guys should listen to it. That's hard to find these days. It's like only on YouTube and some weird video of me, like wandering through Colorado, just a heads up, like on hair, oh. but like, yeah, it's we'll on in there. The show notes. We'll put in the show. It's, <laughs> it's honestly like one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. Oh, um, so tell us about your first experience with motherhood. And then I want to hear about what it's like now having cash and yeah, no, I mean, being a mom is insane and it, it feels insane. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I've always been a pretty fearful person when it comes to medical procedures. Mm-hmm. So I'm shocked that I've had three C-sections at this point, one of which was a seven pound tumor in my uterus, but like three slices through the same spot in my body. And it's brutal, you know, and then this thing comes out and it's like the, the meaning of life, like you're literally looking at the meaning of life and like, it's all so incredibly hard to withstand that level of love and that level of pain and that level of like, cause it is death too, right? Like when you're interacting with the birth of your child, you're also interacting with your own death on some level. And that baby just died to the etheric plane. You're interacting with this cross section between that world and this world. And I don't know, I've never experienced anything like it. It's like true surrealism. And I think with Ula, you know, I was in love with her. You can't not be in love with your baby. You know, like I was in love. I wasn't ready to be a mom at that time. And it was really hard for me because I was 26. And I remember just being like, I don't even know how to do this. But I did. Like, you just figure it out, you know. And I was actually a really good mom until she just died. And she died on her four-month birthday. That was part of my whole, like, God doesn't. It really exists, you know, and I went right to heroin after her funeral. I went and picked up like a hundred dollars of heroin and I was like, fuck this, fuck mm-hmm. you, fuck this, fuck everything. And it was the best excuse ever. And today I'm a different person. I've been sober for 12 years. I'm coming up on 13 years of sobriety. I live this completely really boring life you know my life is very not boring it's super exciting but i'm saying it's very g-rated it's not like there's prostitutes coming through there's no like swinger parties in my living room there's no cocaine on a mirror if anything it's like mr rogers neighborhood levels right so to watch cash come in you know she has such a structured life her life is like very very structured she goes to bed at the same time she has a nap at the same time she eats at the same times like her life is very very safe and structured and it's all because of my life being so safe and structured right so Mm -hmm. i get to provide that for another human being today do you teach her meditation I do think she's a little too young to really fully learn meditation, but she sits with me sometimes when I'm meditating. She does little movement exercises with me. And I taught her like a little breath exercise with her hand where she like inhales with this finger and then exhales like, like follows her hand. I think more so at four is when it really becomes possible for children to learn different types of meditation. So with Wallace, he'll come in and I'm meditating and he's like, I want to meditate. And then he just wants to sit in my lap and be like, <laughs> you know. Oh, <laughs> you're lucky he sits. She just kind of starts, she sits for like one second and then she's like runs and starts jumping. Well, 
Yeah. He sits for a second and then he'll start hitting my face and trying to get my attention, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this is a different kind of meditation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like this is my meditation now. We are meditating at that age naturally. So I don't think that at that age, a kid needs to get into Lotus, sit down and start, you know, repeating a mantra in their head or like praying or whatever. Like she prays before meals and stuff, which is hilarious too. Aww. Cause she's like, she sits there. She's like, and then she's like, Amen! <laughs> um, but I just, I think we are a walking meditation at that age. They see us doing it. And I do believe that real parenting is just modeling. She sees us meditating mom and dad every day. And eventually that's going to osmosis into her if she wants to. I mean, she also could turn into a serial killer. I don't know what she wants to do with her life, you know? <laughs> She's honestly the most precious little thing I've ever seen. Oh my God. So tell me at age four, what are you going to start doing with her? I think I'll sit her down with Lotus and teach her new breathing techniques. Maybe give her a little mantra. You know, we'll just try different things. I'll feel into it. I'm more of like a in the spot kind of person. So like what comes to me at that time. I love the way that you talk about your love for cash. Like when you write about her, I can just feel the vibrations coming all the way through the screen. She is so beautiful. You guys have such a beautiful connection. It's so palpable. And your whole life is an incredible inspiration. You are you know, so blessed and you bring so many blessings to this planet. I'm so grateful to you for being here today and for sharing so much of yourself with all of us. Thank you. I feel the same way about you. You know that. I know that. I love you, lady. I so appreciate your time. And everybody, go check out Biet's book, Don't Just Sit There. And is there anything else that you would like to share with us that you're up to now? If you just follow me on Instagram, I'm at Guided by Biet. There'll be so much more always. So, yeah. Amazing. And definitely go see Biet in person. Her uh, workshop is absolutely out of this world. I love you, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Love you. Love you. Bye. That was another episode of Big Energy with me, your host, Cassie Underwood. Were you into it? Go ahead and click the subscribe button and leave a review. You can also find me online at CassieUnderwood.com. See you next time. And remember, Money Metaphysics for Maverick Women, my six-month program, is open for enrollment. Learn more and register at CassieUnderwood.com forward slash MMMW.